So uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Generalize Panel Discussion, Chapter Four, where we are going to be talking about financial aid and scholarships. And our panelists today, uh, Aranya and Samarth from Yale and UPenn, respectively, are going to talk more about uh, how should one go about applying to these universities with scholarships. So without further ado, I'm the moderator. My name is Vishesh. I'm a final year student at University of California in Davis, uh, pursuing my undergraduate degree in economics and marketing. And as our panelists today, we have Samarth and Aranya. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Aranya from Kolkata, and I'm a first year at Yale, uh, intending on pursuing computer science and psychology. And I got a near full scholarship at Yale, which helped me attend the university. Um, yes, uh, excited to talk with all of you today. Uh, thank you, Aranya. Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, wherever respected you are in the world. Uh, pretty tough for me today since I was out last night. So today morning is going to be tough. But anyway, uh, I'm a freshman at Penn. Uh, I'm starting in the Minty program, pursuing a dual degree uh, from Wharton in business and Penn engineering and computer science. Uh, I was also uh, about a near 100% uh, need based scholarship. And yeah, I'm really active on campus. And uh, I just look forward to guiding you guys about financial aid and admission in general at Penn. Uh, thank you, Samad. So uh, moving on to our topics of discussion. Uh, so first question for Aranya, uh, did you receive any scholarship from other, you know, like from any other university apart from Yale or was it just from Yale? Uh, yes, I did. So Yale scholarships, as you all know, is only need based, but I got merit scholarships from Vanderbilt and Rice, which are also almost like 85% to 90%. And then I also received a full ride from University of Richmond. And these were the ones that are most notable. And so, you know, like the big question, why Yale? I mean, when you received scholarship from other universities as well, was it something about Yale that you found attractive, like more attractive than other universities? Was it scholarship or was it just the program at Yale? I think overall, like Yale definitely is more prestigious than the rest, but also uh, I appealed my aid at Yale and told them about the other scholarships and they increased it a bit, which helped me make my decision. But also uh, given that I'll be spending some amount of money on my college education, I wanted a larger investment and I believe that Yale was the right place um, to be. Right. Thank you. Uh, Samad, could you please briefly shed light on your admission story? Great. So my admission story was uh, something like this. I was very focused on Harvard because I was working with uh, Harvard, a uh, uh, professor at Harvard. So I wanted to go there and uh, I wanted to be a computer science at a uh, computer science student at Harvard. Uh, later in the stage, I got to know about this amazing program at Penn, uh, the MIT program, where you know you can do a dual degree in business and computer science. And I thought this is really important because I never wanted to leave anything. Uh, because I think if I would have gone to Harvard for doing a computer science, I would have just been focused on resource rather than, you know, the more on the entrepreneurship side. So I always wanted to become an entrepreneur. That's what, you know, attracted me towards the MIT program. In fact, uh, technically, I only applied to Penn, got in at Penn, and I didn't apply anywhere else. But uh, because since it was an EA, I also applied to two, three more places. Uh, and uh, till December, uh, I applied to like 11 EA colleges, but I got to know back from like uh, two, three of them. Uh, the other two places were, I think, uh, Tulane and Emory. Uh, both of the places I got a full ride, but uh, of course I, I didn't go there. And uh, uh, yeah, and other places I had to withdraw my application since that's what happens uh, when you accept an early decision. Uh, why did I choose Penn? I think, uh, it was a very holistic decision because uh, it was, it was, I think more of an issue than selecting Penn over Tulane and Emory was, uh, was that I could have applied to RD and all that stuff. But since it was an ED, I couldn't breach the contract. But uh, the other thing which I liked about Penn was that it's a, it's just too, it's a very social community. Uh, it's, it's like uh, 
very good opportunities, especially the program is very prestigious. Uh, I only apply to MND program. Uh, Penn gives you uh, an option to apply to MND program as well as uh, a CS or a business program because I was very sure if I want to go to Penn, I want to be in the MND program since the since it's highly selective. Uh, I don't think so. Anyone from my state uh, ever before has been to MND. So yeah, that's why I chose Penn. And what exactly is the MNT program? If you don't mind me asking. Right. So it's a it's a it's a batch of fifty students per year, uh, and uh, we do a dual degree uh, in business and uh, in general. So basically, while when we graduate, we get two degrees, uh, and uh, we have a lot of uh, support system around this program. It's a the alumni is very very tight knit. Uh, and uh, it's the, the most, uh, the best part is that because it is highly selective, the people who come in the program are very nice. So I, I think for international students, as specifically for international students, I would say the selection rate is quite near below 0.5%. So uh, very less people make it. And uh, we have like eight international boys out of 50 MAD students and out of like, I don't know, 15, 20,000 applicants who specifically apply to MAD. So, it's really selective. It makes it really prestigious. Uh, we have like our dedicated uh, guidance, dedicated counselors, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a it's a very well known program on campus. So you say anyone about MND on campus, they know, even if it's a professor, a student, or anyone. So yeah. Thank you, Samit, and congratulations on your admission. I think you're a freshman at UPenn, if I'm not wrong, right? Yeah, I'm a freshman. Congratulations. Uh, I don't know. Um, which part of your application do you think uh, played the most in integral role, uh, you know, in your acceptance into Yale? Uh, I think it was not my achievements, but the way I portrayed them. So when I saw this question, you know, before this panel, I got to is that like, in not only in India, a lot of like international students, <clears throat> what they want to do in their application is like try to show off and show that they are they have a lot of different you know aspects to their personality. But I personally don't think that is the best way. And what I did, instead of telling them what they wanted to listen or they wanted to read, I showed them what I was. So I did not want to be wanted to be, you know, a very top scientist who's also environmentally conscious and also does community service on the side. I just kept it very simple, uh, highlighted my top two three achievements, and that is what I think um, helped me get into Yale. Right. And, and that's actually a very important point because often a lot of internationals think that, you know, let's do social service, let's do business, then let's have a startup, let's have multiple things and just, it just becomes a mess. And so keeping it simple always helps. So uh, like, did you just focus on a few activities and uh, built up on them or uh, did you do like a bunch of activities? Uh, so for me, yeah. yeah, for me, it started in 10th grade when I participated in a national fair called the Iris National Fair, and I uh, got to represent India uh, at the US uh, on the International Fair. So that is where I began thinking about studying in the US, and I hinged the rest of my application on this one single achievement. Uh, instead of trying out for multiple different things and not being good at them, I just went ahead in this research area. I tried to uh, you know, make an organization that implemented my research in the real world. Um, and I definitely agree with you on the on that point because I think unrealized model in specific is very helpful because you can talk to students at the university and you know identify what uh, specific items you need for an application rather than being a generalist, being trying trying to do everything in the world and um, not being very successful at like you know a few uh, unique things. Right. Yeah. And I was uh, one of the first students who applied through Unilever. I I'm 100% with Arana. Talking to people in universities gave me a lot of insightful information that I can, you know, just focus on three or four things rather than uh, doing like 10 different things in, from like, you know, 10 different spheres. So yes, it is very important to just focus on what you're passionate about. Uh, Samarth, what, is, uh, what was one unique part about your application? Uh, what worked for you and what did not work for you? Well, I would definitely say that uh, uh, one of the things which I felt uh, was not really unique, but I think that which stood out was that uh, 
I already did a capstone, like sort of a capstone degree from Penn, uh, which was provided to me by British Petroleum that I worked for like a year with their, on one of their SDG uh, sites. So I think that shows, uh, you know, because I think the schools do, uh, do see if you have past, uh, you know, past relations with the school. So say for suppose if you have done research with any of the professors already in the school, and in my case, like I already did a sort of capstone degree from their uh, advanced capstone department. So that really makes a difference. Uh, something you need about my application is that uh, rather than most of the other people in MNT who are very heavily academically focused, I was someone who was very, uh, uh, you know, what you could say as a generalist. Uh, I, I used to play tennis uh, for quite a good amount of my life. I wanted to become a tennis player, in fact, uh, and studying was my second option. So <laughs> that my, my common app essay was about how I, want, how I wanted to become a tennis player and uh, how my life revolved about uh, tennis. Uh, and then I think uh, I was I was really interested in startups. I did a startup with uh, a few of my friends back in India. So uh, I think being an all-rounded application uh, stood out uh, in perspective of MNT more than uh, you know just being an Olympian or something like that. And what did not work out for you? So like you know that that's absolutely what worked out for you. Uh, you had a few activities. You you were already involved with Penn before you applied then what did not work out for you? Like, as you mentioned that, you know, Penn was like one university which accepted you with uh, such a good amount of scholarship, uh, like such a good amount of aid. Why did others not accept you? Like, what do you think went wrong? And, you know, not to put you on spot there, but like, what, what do you think would have gone yeah. wrong? Well, I didn't get rejected anywhere else. So I don't know if uh, so the universities I applied to, I got accepted everywhere, but, uh, uh, what wouldn't have worked out was that, uh, I don't know, I have a complete contrast from other applicants uh, when talking about, you know, writing essays and common app essays. Uh, also, when I was working with other students, I think most of the people, uh, uh, they focus on, you know, showing their uh, more of an internal side, how they feel about it. Say, I suppose if you, if you will talk about an activity, they will talk more about the involvement done rather than their achievements. Uh, well, I feel that's good. Uh, but I also feel that, uh, you know, if you see it from an admission point of view, the admission officer, uh, like someone told me, the admission officer gets like three minutes to view your application, right? So, uh, I, th I feel it's better for me to, you know, display my major achievements in my essays rather than talking about a little bit more on a personal side. Uh, I know it's, it's very different from what uh, any advisor would say, but that's my perspective. That worked out for me. Uh, and, uh, but it might also not work for uh, other universities where uh, an admission officer might feel that you're bragging about it. But uh, if you read any of my applications, uh, like most of them are filled with numbers that I help these many people. I source this much fund. I won this many tournaments. And only my common app essay is a little bit more on the personal side of how it revolved around tennis. Because I have a strong view that university likes numbers, uh, especially highly selective universities, highly selective program like Penn they are more focused on, you know, just take the, just choose the best people out of there. So not to undersell yourself, I just put in everything I have, but it might also work other ways uh, where an admission officer might think that you're bragging, so yeah. Right, yeah. So, so that was something different from what I did. Uh, I personally just focused on a few things and uh, then I just did a build up on those in my common app essay and my university specific essays. Um, Moving on. University selection. So, uh, I don't know. How did you choose your university list? Like, how did you make your university list? Uh, for me, I was definitely looking at universities that provide financial aid to Indians. So, there are a lot of lists online. I'm pretty sure, you know, like, can also help, um, like, give you a list of universities that in the past have provided aid to international students. So that was a big criteria. And I was also looking for universities with good neuroscience or CS programs because those were the fields I was interested in. 
and I ended up applying to a lot of the top schools, uh, like the T20s in the US, and uh, a few liberal arts colleges, which also provide a good amount of aid. But I tended, I focused more on the research universities uh, because that is what I wanted to do. Uh, one point here, though, I think, uh, is that I left out of universities um, just like randomly because I thought I did not fit in with their culture. But I think that was a mistake. For example, I did not end up applying to UPenn because I thought, you know, it's a pre-professional school for students who want to be doctors or like engineers. And but in the end of the day, I think um, all the schools in the U.S. are very different. And unless and until you grew up here. You don't really know which you know school or which type of school um, works better for you because the indian education system tries to teach you everything um, and here students can you know actually select their classes in high school as they move forward and kind of narrow down uh, if they want a liberal arts education which is like um you know they want to do their thing but they also want to explore other fields on the side or if they want to do like engineering or science so schools like you know MIT or Georgia Tech. So students here have a good idea when they graduate from high school, but I don't think Indian students generally have uh, a huge inclination. So I think you should keep your options open and not exclude schools just based on culture, but instead look for things you really need, such as you know like career, financial aid, um, yeah, things like that. So so if you don't mind me asking, how much time? Did you spend on you know researching about these things while uh, uh, making a university list? I think uh, in total, I definitely spent like uh, three four weeks uh, making up my entire list, and I did this way back in August or I think July when it was summer break. So I spent a lot of time, you know, just listing down universities on a Google sheet, their deadlines, and uh, what percentage of aid they provide to internationals how many percentage of internationals get aid. Right. Uh, Samar, how about you? How did you choose uh, you know, your university list? Right. Uh, is, is my uh, audio better right now? Because I uh, think yes. uh, it, was a, it was a bit uh, low before, right? Uh, yeah, now you're audible. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, how did I choose my university? Uh, I think uh, for me, it was more about the program rather than anything else because uh, uh i wanted to be involved in greek life of course uh, i think uh, many of the people sitting here might not know about greek life but uh, i uh because it's it's a very um uh, it's, it's a very low priority thing especially for indian students but uh, i always wanted to be a part of greek life since uh, i love the brotherhood so greek life might be one of the aspects when i looked at pen but uh, other things i would say is uh, the program is amazing uh for anyone applying to any college, I would say don't go by the name, go by the program. Say for suppose if someone is going to, you know, wants to study design or something like that, uh, I feel a Rhode Island is far much more better than even Harvard. So it doesn't matter uh, where, which, which place, which brand do you get, it's more relevant about which, uh, which sort of uh, subject you're taking. Um, and as Aranya said, yeah, but, Penn is like quite pretty professional in terms of, you know, engineering uh, some med medicine or even if it's Wharton. But uh, I feel uh, at Penn, I got a, a very good combination of brand names since uh, Wharton is an amazing business school, very renowned, reputed in uh, among the recruiters. And uh, the other thing was that uh, uh, the program was really good. So that's how I chose my universities. And even the other universities I was choosing were more about uh, because what I say students mostly they just choose the university by saying okay Duke it's going to be good it's famous mm -hmm. I would rather say picturize yourself there for four years and I'm saying you these four years matter a lot you end up having yourself in a bad company of people for four years or not really in a specific uh, environment or where you don't like the university uh, you're going to ruin your four years, honestly. So it's it's better to look for universities where you would enjoy. If you don't like big universities, if, if, if you're in a school and you don't like an environment where there are, you know, 26,000 people and you strive in a small place, if you, get an, if you get an option to go to Harvard or a small college like Caltech, 
go to Caltech because that's going to be better for you. So look for other factors. Uh, look for what you like. I, I, I love tennis. Tennis has been my life. So I couldn't have gone to a college which doesn't have a tennis court. So um, that's something. So yeah, definitely look for other things as well. Look for niche things. Do you like this program? Do you like this club? Uh, and mention them in your essays as well. Thank you, Samit. And actually, that, that's a very important point. And as we have a lot of parents with us today, it is. I would like to say something. It's not important as to what the university ranking is, but it's more important as to what is best fit for you. So, like uh, for me as a person, uh, I like closed communities. And uh, you know, Davis is uh, like a very small town, a cozy town. Uh, literally, our town's population is hundred thousand, and seventy thousand are basically students. So during summer break, you'll just have like twenty thousand people vendors, professors, no one else. So it's essentially a student town. So if that's something for you, you should uh, look at these options as well, because uh, often Harvard or Penn or the Ivies or the top 10 universities in the world might not be the place for you, might not give you the best, uh, you know, uh, for you. Uh, next, I think uh, Samar mentioned Greek life, and I'm not sure if people know. So Greek life is basically, uh, I think fraternities and sororities, it's basically brotherhood, where uh, you join, uh, like, you know, this, uh, this, fraternity and they help you grow as a person. They'll help you uh, in your professional career as well in future. Uh, so that's a bit about Greek life. Uh, one announcement, please. If you have any questions, you can also use the chat feature and uh, you know just put your questions there and uh, our team will uh, make sure to answer them. Thank you. Uh, Arane, next question for you. What is the difference between financial aid and scholarships? Um. I think, yeah, this, these terms are used really interchangeably, but there's a huge difference. So financial aid, uh, you don't have to you know, write separate essays or um, a separate activities list. It is something they, a university provides you uh, looking at your uh, financial situation. So your income tax documents, your assets. And of course it can be both types like need-based and merit-based. But usually 90% of the financial aid, I think, in the U.S. is need-based. So they'll just look at how much annual income you have. And based on that, they'll calculate and they'll ask you to pay a certain amount. And then they'll cover the rest of the amount. And you don't need to repay that financial aid back. Scholarships, on the other hand, I think you apply for. So you oh, most of the times have to create a separate profile. You have to write one or two extra essays. And scholarships are definitely more competitive. Uh, personally, I got uh, one scholarship at Vanderbilt known as the Cornelius, which is a full tuition. So there are a lot of scholarships um, at the top universities and even at mid-tier universities uh, for international students where they provide uh, anywhere from 50% of your tuition to even your full tuition and sometimes even full ride. So that is the difference, I think. One, you apply for with essays and the other, you just submit your CSS profile. Right. Right. So uh, just building on that, uh, so I, I feel that the basic difference is when you look at financial aid, it is need-based financial aid. And when, it, when you look at scholarships, it's basically merit-based scholarship. When you're looking at financial aid, you have to submit something called the CSS profile. And uh, as uh, Arana mentioned, they'll be looking at your uh, parents' uh, tax returns, you know, your income, and a lot of other things will be kept into factor before offering you financial aid. So uh, just a, a build-up question on that, uh, Arana, someone is asking how difficult is it uh, to get scholarships, uh, like to get a financial aid from Yale? I don't think it's difficult. Uh, so this was a uh, like a thought I had too, that you know these universities maybe take one or two students who are international on aid and the rest, they just take people who can pay. But I think at the end of the day, all the top 20 universities in the US um, and even beyond, uh, they want good students. They want students who will add to the community, who will add to campus life. So if they like your application, if they really want you, they're willing to pay as much as needed to get you to their campus. So it does not matter like uh, what you, you know, uh, your financial situation. Uh, uh, it does not matter what a financial situation is to be accepted to top schools, but rather what your application is, what your profile is, and what are you bringing to their uh, university. Right. So, so essentially, that's the difference between need-based and need-blind. So need-based is when you absolutely need it, and uh, need-blind financial aid is when you know your application matters more than how much you actually need it, right? 
Yeah, so uh, there are need blind schools and there are need aware schools, as you said. So in the US, there are five need blind schools. So Harvard, Yale, Princeton, MIT, and Amherst. But I would say even the top need aware schools, so the other Ivy League schools and uh, say Vanderbilt or Northwestern, even they have a, a really good, uh, uh, you know, uh, endowments so they can spend uh, their endowments on international students as well and you can easily look this up online they're required to state how many international students they give aid to every year and what is their average package like right uh, thank you uh, so uh, samarth what helped you get a scholarship like what helped you bag a scholarship and just just a second question to this someone asked uh, priyanshi uh, asked i think uh, could you please uh, share the sources of what kind of extracurricular activities can we do? So could you please like shed some extracurricular activities that you did? I think you already mentioned that, but could you please go in like a bit detail about them? Great. Um, I would say, uh, first of all, those extracurricular activities stand out in anyone's application, uh, the ones which are not done by the purpose of getting into college. So uh, please make this sure. Uh, don't try to do extracurricular activities for colleges, rather try to, you know, display those activities which you did from your heart better in your application. Uh, then I got involved with the, with the startup when I did, um, uh, when I played tennis or when I was involved with British Petroleum, I never thought I'm going to apply to an Ivy League college or do anything like that. Uh, but somewhere down the line they helped me i used to be a guitarist i used to be a singer i never knew uh, that i'm doing all of this for my college application it was just a part of my personality and i displayed it really well uh, in my application that's why i got it but for someone who thinks that you know they're not able to fill in the 10 uh, blocks of activity and they want to do something new i would say don't deviate and do something you know which is extremely new because you now, since uh, someone in this condition, I would I would say that they're in grade tenth or eleventh or in fact twelfth, or some of them might be even droppers. Uh, I would say do something which you have already done. If you're if you're a PCM student, or you can pursue a research uh, in something. If you are interested into computer science, uh, you can do some uh, certification courses. But to be very honest, certification courses do not matter at all because no one is uh, asking for your certi certificate. So a person randomly just writing that he did a course from Harvard on edX and a person who genuinely did it, there's no, uh, there's no differentiating point between them. And uh, so rather, you know, approach a professor, maybe at a good university like IIT or IIM or something like that, and try to do research with them. Uh, if you are in grade 10, 11th, or 12th, there are a lot of, you know, NGO organizations. There are a lot of uh, these uh, social ventures which can uh, give you a part-time internship or maybe a paid internship in some cases, which is quite difficult to get, especially in grade 11th or 12th, but sometimes you can bag them. I think uh, most these things make uh, a lot of sense in your application because other things, say for suppose, uh, a lot of people focus on MUNs. I, I don't really know if MUNs make a lot of uh, impact on the application because everyone is doing that. So try to do something which is extremely different. Like uh, if you see my 10 activities, they were not something very, very, uh, very, very uh, common. Like working for one year in British Petroleum, I don't think it's common. So uh do things which are not common don't just do one mun in your 10th grade and be like yes i was i did mun and all of this you can do that you can mention that but don't rely on that so uh, the sources for um the sources for uh extracurricular activity is finding your own niche if you're someone like if you're applying for design make a very amazing portfolio work for an NGO, do their photography or something like that. So find your own niche, do something big and uh, don't go for generalizations like MUN debates and stuff like that. Yeah, another point I want to add there is no activity is small and no activity is big. It, it, what matters is what you're passionate about and how well you can write about it. So let's say even if you've done an international level activity, but you can't 
write about it or you can't talk about it in your interview then well it's it's not a good enough activity even a sm- the smallest of the activities can get you into an iv as long as you're passionate about it and you can write well about it uh thank you so much uh arane i think there are two people who are asking about uh how much like how important are good standardized score tests and your high school grades for uh, you know getting accept getting a scholarship at an ivy league school i think i i also saw a bunch of questions about high school grades so at the end of the day it's holistic so they look at all parts of your application so you know if you have a 85% or something don't worry too much about it but try to explain it in an additional circumstances i believe personally that you know no single part of your application can determine uh, your acceptance and then your financial aid but um, look at the accepted scores of the universities so traditionally you want to be uh, above their 50th percentile at least for their sat or act uh, and indian uh, schools usually don't have gpas so i would say uh, try to have above 90% for most of your subjects because here uh, the cut off for a a is 93% and then the a minus is 90 to 93 so anything above a 90% is good right and, and how about a uh, standardized test like do you think given the pandemic scenario when you know uh, a lot of people can't actually go and take tests do you think it's important uh, like uh, these tests are important for students i think so definitely because uh, a lot of schools have gone test optional but my personal experience talking with other people has shown that uh if you have a moderately good score you know anything above say a 1450 uh, or even like 1430 you should go ahead and submit it because uh it's better to have something rather than have nothing and you know just leave it to them to guess how uh, how good your aptitude is because uh, the sat is one thing that really you know they can compare all the international students and even the domestic students um across because it is a standardized score uh, exam at the end of the day like and, and building up on what arana said i think essentially you are going to a university to study so no matter like even if you have not done really great extracurricular activities please focus on your academics because essentially they are quintessential to getting you into a good university and uh, regarding standardized tests it is important that you take them uh, before you apply because e- even during the pandemic because it just shows universities that you have take- gone the extra mile that despite the pandemic you are very serious about your education and you know you have taken these standardized tests uh, samarth uh, does a university usually give scholarships to international students and like what percentage so uh like before i answer that uh, my standard answer to the last question you asked uh, if the sat scores and the academic scores matter or not uh, mm-hmm. i would say if you have not given your sat sat till now my answer is yes it matters and if you have given and you don't have a good score it doesn't matter a lot you can cover it <laughs> with your essays uh, because mm-hmm. the thing is that uh, uh, it's a very straightforward answer it's like me asking you how how much does your 12th grade matter in life like if you have not given your 12th just work for it get a good grade but if you have given and you know you didn't get a good grades for the end of world so uh the the question is quite subjective and uh, so I, i would say for pen at least uh, pen was pen is uh, need aware for international students so if you are applying for financial aid uh, the sat scores and academic scores do matter a lot coming on the uh, question of uh, does my university usually get scholarship to international student uh, i would say pen somewhere is uh, reluctant uh, for indian kids I, i i don't know if i should say that since i got 100% but uh, it's 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 unfair to say that but i would say uh, as i've seen not a lot of people from india are on financial aid uh, but if your application is good if you if you are a perfect fit for the college what i can promise you is that pen wouldn't hinder uh, you know your growth because of uh, because of your financial circumstances so even after i came to pen and uh, i needed some sort of financial help which is like an emergency funding or something like i have to go for a, a foreign trip or something like that i have to do a semester abroad pen has been extremely supportive uh, they it's their least concern about uh, the students financial circumstances 
and especially during covid they have given out a lot of scholarships to international kids so uh, for international students i would say yes they they are quite heavily generous uh, and uh, uh, when it talk when you talk about india i would say they are generous but it, it more so matters on what your application is if your application is good yes you will get in and uh, you you won't be hindered by the financial factor right uh, thank you so much so there's there's someone asking if my school doesn't provide uh, aps would it affect my application uh, i don't think schools basically they teach aps but they don't like you, you can give the exams anywhere you want so essentially you can even prepare outside school if you want and yes they will affect because they just show that you've gone the extra mile and how do ap exams help uh, universities uh, you know they basically help universities place you in a certain bracket because your uh, school exams are essentially only uh, you know like related to your school right and and the coursework you're doing in school so they can't universities can't understand as to where uh, to place you academically but these ap exams are standardized tests uh, which are uh, same across you know the globe which is why it is very easy if you uh, easy for universities to place you in a certain academic bracket once you get a certain score at an at, at an ap test so yes they are very important um i don't know could you please uh, there's a student who is asking uh, regarding getting 100% scholarship uh, at your university so uh, like what again like i know we're going in rounds but what is quintessential to you know uh, achieving that i think the first thing to get 100% for need based aid is your parents have to earn less than 50 lakhs a year like apart from that uh, they won't give you 100% aid um, also with like you know uh, not a very high level of assets and other things so you know other properties but in general uh, yale i think is quite generous like i know for smaller countries you know like pakistan sri lanka or bangladesh almost everyone who goes to yale gets more than 80% scholarship uh, but for india since you know people who apply tend to be middle class upper middle class there's still a good percentage of people who are on a lot of aid uh, this year i think there are about 12 to 13 people from india and like five of us have like near full rights so i think that is a very good amount given that it is so competitive from india Uh, and i agree with summer that you have to be really good with your academics with your sat scores with your uh high school scores because you know they have a lot of kids from different education boards in india they have the ib they have like the national boards so in order to stand out you really need the highest scores in your own board they won't compare you with people from other education boards but you definitely need to be at the top of your um school as well as your education board and i think which that is also a reason why standardized tests are important as i mentioned because they they help you place uh, you know uh, yourself globally so because the papers are same uh, across the globe uh, i don't know if i'm not wrong i also uh, remember you mentioned at the beginning that you received scholarships from different universities and then you asked yale to uh, increase the scholarship aid right so uh, how did that work like like how does that work Yes. Uh, also, you reminded me of another thing I wanted to say, which is that um, you know, if you don't get financial aid, you also have these scholarships. So even if a school is need aware, so like Vanderbilt or Rice, I definitely did not expect them to give me such huge, you know, scholarships. So that is definitely one option you have if your, you know, your parents earn above a certain amount, or you, in general, need a lot of aid, uh, but you can get it in the form of scholarships. Or uh, to answer your question, I think that. No, um, I'm sorry. What was your question again? So, so my question was: I remember uh, that at the beginning uh, of the presentation, you said that uh, uh, you oh, received a certain amount yeah. of scholarship. In, yeah, appealing for yeah. right. So, mm-hmm. what happens at many schools, like all universities, provide this option where you can submit extra documents to um, appeal your aid. So initially, Yale gave me around eighty percent, which was also pretty generous. but then i submitted you know extra documents so i submitted the fact that i got a need based scholarship from university of richmond and uh, usually they don't match with universities beneath a certain rank so they'll tend to match or compete their aid with universities in the same range so ex- for example yale would match aid with any other top 20 universities but in my case they did increase my aid so after like 5 10 days they wrote back to me and they 
gave me a new financial aid letter, which increased my aid to 85%. Right. Uh, uh, thank you, Arunai. So uh, now, since I, I can see a lot of questions popping up in the chat and we're almost approaching towards the end, uh, whoever has questions, kindly write me or like, you know, one, two, three, and I will uh, call you out, unmute yourself, and you can directly address uh, the panelists. So does anyone have any questions? Just, just type out in the chat. Like just type one or two, just type like, okay. So Ayush, uh, you can unmute yourself and you can just ask us what questions you have. Hello. Would it be wise to take a year drop and try to improve my profile through social work and co other courses maybe? Uh, who wants to answer that? Is it specific for someone or is it general? It's, it's general. Uh, Samit, would you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I can go about. Uh, I would say um, you can, uh, I think there's no foundation in applying both the years, right? Uh, I think if you apply on the RD round, you can also apply right now. Uh, I don't know if, if the RD, yeah, I think the RD deadlines have gone by, but as a, as a general, I, I'm, I'm answering that. If you are uh, planning to take a uh, one year drop after 12 and improve your profile, it's better to also apply right now because I think uh, if, if you have something very big coming in the uh, upcoming year, which is gonna make a very big difference in your profile, then it's something else. But if, if, you're, if, you, if you don't think that it's anything big and it, you know it would be really small activities here and there, uh, then it's better to save your year because I will tell you, most of the students here at Penn, most of the students in my program are like one year older than me or in fact, two year older than me because they took a gap year because of COVID. And I can tell you how much uh, impact an year makes, uh, especially in the industry of finance, because I, I'm looking to work for, you know, consulting companies and stuff like that. So even if you're like one year younger to everyone, you get an extra year to work on any big project. So think, think from that point of view that how much an year would make a difference in your, uh, in your life when you, when you uh, say, for suppose everyone is starting a job at 23, you start at 22. So uh it's something like that but uh, definitely taking a drop year is uh, a very common thing it's not uh, looked down upon because uh, a lot of people in my program are there and uh, it's 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 good it's, it's really a subjective question uh, but it depends on what do you plan in the coming year if you are not deciding on what you are going to do in the coming year better to go to any college which you got into right now but if you are, if you have plans, say, suppose you're going to do a startup in the coming year, you're going to do something big, then it's okay. Then you can apply next year. Just okay. a follow up question I have. Yeah, what, what if I apply and in the same, I don't get admitted and I reapply to that same university the year after? Does that affect my chances? If that hurts my chances if I re reapply the next year also to that same university. I don't know. What do you want to take that or summit? Uh, yeah, I think, sorry. Uh, I think they do keep your application file from previous year, but I don't think they, you know, they compare it. Also, one more thing I would like to add is if you're starting something new in our gap year, make sure, you know, you explain that because if they, you know, understand that you just took a gap year to just do, you know, the social work or the courses for the sake of getting into college, that won't be very substantial. But if you can show how, you know, you planned ahead and maybe you extended some of your existing activities, uh, that would really help explain your gap year. Thank you. Yeah, so, so, so as long as Ayush, you can explain your gap year well, as long as uh, you take some extra tests, for example, I'm assuming the reason you want to take a drop year is because of COVID and because you could not give uh, APs or like SATs or other standardized tests, I would highly recommend uh, also show some kind of academic proficiency within the year. Don't just completely put a halt to your application unless and until you have a million dollar startup. Okay, so, so that's another advice for you. Um, next, we have uh, Tejas who's asking, could you please be uh, all be more precise about the extracurricular activities? So Tejas, uh, in just one word, it totally depends. You know, it depends on what your major is, what your uh, uh, specific uh, area of interest is. So that is why it is not important. Like it, it won't be fruitful if we tell you the kind of activities that we have done because they, they are basically catering to our specific needs. Uh, next, we have a question from Naru who is saying, 
is hey is open board does open board affect scholarships so i'm assuming uh, that uh, he or she is asking about uh, does a particular kind of board affect the amount of scholarships that you get uh, i don't know what you want to answer that like does it matter yeah. matter i think uh, um, he might be referring to like nios like open schooling uh, in part, in general i think it does not matter i have a friend who did the nios and the 11th and 12th and got into some liberal arts colleges so uh, as long as the rest of your application is you know at par with people from other boards and you have good grades in your own board that is what matters most rather than comparing you with people you know in other education boards okay thank you i, I hope that answers your question naru um people uh, whose questions we have not been able to address it will be great if you could kindly uh, we ask them because uh, or you can just unmute yourself and ask them because there are literally a lot of questions i mean one of them is sohail is asking i'm currently in grade 11th and i have taken the sag twice and uh, with a 1480 and a 1490 score respectively and as a super score of 1510 what's your genuine opinion about the score samarth i think a 1510 score is a pretty like high score right given the pandemic yeah, and given the that- I would say anything above fifteen twenty is evaluated. Uh, like fifteen ten, fifteen twenty is evaluated on the same scale. Uh, it really uh, depends on uh, if you can give a third attempt really close, um, and if you if you're not sacrificing a lot. Say, for suppose it's in the if you're if the RD deadline has not passed by, ED deadline has not passed by, and you have one more attempt left, why not just go and give it? Uh, because there's nothing uh, wrong in just just uh, you know appearing for it but if you are planning to take a drop year after 1510 no don't do that don't do that at all 1510 is a really good score uh, in fact i would say 1450 above i would consider is a uh, is a really good score especially if you are a student from india right uh, thank you samarth i hope that answers your question um aditya is asking how is the application assessment process for transfer students different from that of candidates applying as freshmen uh, i don't know do you have any idea or uh... uh yes i think the only difference is they ask for academic records from your current university apart from that it is all the same so they'll still probably need a sat score or an act score they can consider you know your existing ap scores or other scores you have or uh, they'll also need your english proficiency or high school records so the everything is same except that you need to explain you know the one year at at the university you are currently at and send transcripts from your university in order to transfer um one more thing i'd like to add is that uh for some universities transfer students don't get aid so make sure to read up on that but usually for the top universities they have the same financial aid policy right and just to add on what uh, aruna said i think uh, transfer applications are genuinely much more intense and difficult to get in uh, uh, you know in comparison to freshman applications i mean uh, if you can just search on google you'll find that in 2015 10 uh, where samarth goes only 25 students international students were actually accepted as transfer applicants so that's actually a very niche number so uh, really do a lot of research and have a very strong application if you're uh, looking to transfer after your freshman year or i i would rather advise that you take a gap year and then reapply because uh, you'll have a fairer shot then um arka is asking does university of pennsylvania or similar reputed private institutions consider international graduate students for need based or need aware aid unfortunately arka we are uh, an undergraduate panel for this you'll have to get in touch with uh, an advisor from unilever who will be able to answer this better for you um sanchali is asking uh, i'm pursuing a fashion designing at symbiosis institute of technology Uh, in india and want to pursue masters abroad again this is a master related question and unfortunately we will not be able to answer that uh what are transcripts that's what priyanshu is asking uh samarth who do you want to answer that it uh not just nothing i think it's uh, just uh, your result from grade 9th or uh, in most cases 9 10th 11th 12th uh and uh, yeah it's from your uh specific academic institution which in our cases are school so it's it's sent through our school i don't know how different schools operate i think uh, my school had uh, some collaboration with cialfo and uh, they used to send the scores automatically to the uh, to to the universities i think it it was far much more easier because 
we had a lot of uh, students going to foreign universities in the past as well so our school used to have a collaboration but i think in other cases you have to get it sealed signed post something like that and all of that i've never gone through that but uh, but yeah i don't think so logistical uh, that is all logistical you don't need to make a lot of uh, uh, you don't need to think a lot about that. It just happens. It's in the process. Uh, but yeah, it's fairly easy if your school has some sort of this uh, link with uh, C Alpha or all of these common app. And uh, I, I don't know what this system, internal system is. But if it's went, if it goes through online, it's far much more easier because it uh, it doesn't cost a lot. Uh, and uh, otherwise, posting and all of that uh, stuff uh, costs a lot. Otherwise, you can just have a stamp copy and just uh, po uh, send it via post to the university you're applying to. And that can be done, uh, I think, through your school front desk or registrar. Uh, Rishabh is asking, uh, another this question is for you. Is a two-year gap uh, feasible or suggested for top colleges? I mean, I would just agree with Samar here is that it depends on how you explain your gap year and what you do in your gap year. There's a person at Yale, actually, who in this year, he took two-year gap but that happened after he got into Yale. So, you know, he took a regular gap and then due to COVID, he took another year uh, off. But as long as you can explain why you took two years off, two years is a huge amount of time, definitely compared to just one year. So make sure to have a good, like, you know, 500 word thing to explain what you did in those two years and how you have changed as a person after you graduated from high school. Um, thank you, Arunai. I hope, Rishabh, that answers your question. Uh, Parv, you're asking how should we prepare for SAT? Uh, I think the best option is uh, go to a test prep center or find a teacher who has been prepping students for SAT. Also, uh, another thing I'd like to add here is uh, self-prep is most important. So if you're spending two hours in class, spend two hours at home and give at least 30 to 40 practice tests from different books. Uh, you can even find them online before taking your final SAT exam uh, in order to ace it. Uh, Samit, would you agree? Or I, I know that you have a good score, a good SAT score. How did you go about uh, preparing for SAT? Yeah, I would definitely say uh, self-study is very important. I did take, uh, uh, there was a very good teacher in my city uh, who taught me for SAT, but uh, uh, I gave my SAT uh, twice. So first time I studied, but the second time I, I didn't go to it. So second time I, I, I studied by myself. I would definitely say that maths is something which is easy for uh, Indian students. So you can get a 800 uh, easily. Uh, although I did a mistake, I was not able to fill in the bubbles properly. So uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was stupid on that point. Uh, so I, in fact, uh, lost more marks in my math section rather than my English section. I got a, a 780 in my English and a 770 on my math. Uh, so uh, not really a good <laughs> thing, but uh, math is easy. Uh, when it comes to English, I, I feel uh, you need to prepare from all of these reading books. And uh, th there are some really good books outside there. Erica Melzer, there's College Panda, all of the things which I prepared from. And uh, not really a legal thing to do, but if you search on some sort of darknet or whatever it is, you can find like past papers, which which, which should not be distributed, but uh, no one cares. So I, I did have a lot of past papers, uh, which is sort of not uh, a good thing, like moral is a good thing, but... Uh, uh, you, you should prepare from them because I think that th those are the best prep thing if you get an actual SAT paper which came out. So I think a lot of Chinese websites, they, they do publish. Right. Uh, thank you, Samarth. So uh, Dhruv is asking, uh, I think, would a uh, uh, second language, uh, you know, which is not relevant to your career interests help you say Hindi uh, or, or uh, bio when you're taking CS. I, I, I really think uh, language, if you're talking about languages like Hindi, English, German, a second language does, ha uh, does help you a lot because I took Hindi in school and I uh, was a teaching assistant for Hindi uh, here for a professor at Davis. And I earned like, like usually a, a normal pay is 13 to $14 for an undergraduate student. And it's very difficult to get a job on campus. 
uh, you know, you, you have to drive a bus or you have to like work at a cafeteria. But for me, I was able to become a TA and I earned like uh, 60 to 80 dollars an hour for, for my work. So definitely, uh, you know, if you have a second or third language uh, that you're very proficient in, yes, uh, keep pursuing it. Um, while uh, Dhruv, you're also asking if bio would help if you're taking CS. Uh, uh, I don't know, would you want to answer that? I think, yeah, I mean, it depends on what you what you want to do. So if you fill out in an intended major, you know, you want to do cognitive science or like computational biology or like CS, but in your essays, you mentioned you want to apply CS to biological systems, then it definitely helps you. Otherwise, I don't think you should decide your you know, school subjects based on your intended major or what you want to do in university, but rather pick your strongest subjects and uh, yeah, the ones you can score most in. Right, though we can even ask, uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah, so what I essentially meant with my question was, um, let's say in your application, you have to submit your scores, right? For, from 10th, 11th, 12th. So let's say you haven't done so well in um, say Hindi or bio, but um, it isn't really part of your course in college, like computer science, will that affect your chances of admission? No, I don't know. Would you want to answer that? Uh, in that case, I don't think no. But again, it's better if it's above ninety percent. I think otherwise, please, uh, like, try to explain it in our additional information. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I so, for example, so. you can. You can... For... Yeah. Oh, I was just saying. I think so. For tenth, eleventh, twelfth, they just see your compiled score. Uh, I don't know if they will, you know, specifically go and see your subject score. That that's a very niche thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure admission officers don't have that much time. So you you submit in the 10th, 11th, 12th score, they will see an aggregate score. You got a 95% aggregate, good enough. And uh, so that's why it's better to, you know, uh, to have a good aggregate score. And if your Hindi and bio scores do affect your aggregate scores, yes, they are important. If they don't, then it's okay. Yeah, and, and you should always like uh, in the additional comment section, use that space to mention as to why your scores are less. So you can simply say that, uh, well, uh, I'm good with physics and chemistry, but I'm not good in biology. And as you can see, I don't want to pursue uh, a degree related to biology. It does not affect my major at all. So hence, uh, you know, kindly consider uh, like a low grade in that. Or maybe like if you were medically, uh, uh, you know, like suffering through something during that, that time. Uh, so Sohail is asking, uh, I also wanted to ask, if it is possible to get into universities and get scholarships if you have very good academics but not very good extracurriculars if yes what is the expectations with that academic profile uh samarth i don't know who wants to take this question uh, i think yeah, I like uh, yeah be good at some some like certain thing like you know samarth he talked a lot about playing tennis and other things me i did research first so uh, one more thing uh, that is important is try to relate your academics and extracurriculars. So it's not like, you know, two different categories altogether that your extracurriculars are one thing and your academics are one thing, but try to have links between both. So you can say like how a certain class, you know, made you intern at some organization or um, inspired you to start some research project. So try to find links between both. Right, uh, I completely agree uh, with you. Uh, Aparna is asking, uh, what do you prefer to take, financial aid or scholarship? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not very really aware about scholarship and financial aid. Uh, I think you guys are the best judge. So, uh, Samit, do you want to answer that? Uh, what do you prefer to what take, you... financial aid or scholarships? Like, it totally depends, I guess. Take, take anything you get. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think the, the question has to be framed in that way that which college would you rather choose? The one which gives a scholarship, a merit-based scholarship or the financial aid. Um, I would say if uh, it's a top university, uh, P20, Ivy League, uh, I think all of them offer a need-based scholarship. So there's not really anything you could do. Uh, it depends on your uh, financial circumstances more so, I would say. If you are someone who is from a very well-to-do family and your financial circumstances won't display that you need a scholarship, then uh, it's better. And if you, even after that, if you want to have a scholarship, it's better to, it's of course, you won't get a scholarship then at a, uh, at a school which provides financial aid scholarships. 
uh, then only apply to schools you know which give merit based scholarship but if you are someone who who thinks that their financial circumstances would allow them to get a good scholarship the, through the need based part uh, there are some uh, calculators out there on internet where you can write your assets liabilities all of that stuff and you can get a good estimate about it uh, but i would say um, merit based scholarship come out to be a little bit uh, uh, you know tougher than uh, financial aid scholarships so uh, special specifically in good universities uh, i know some universities give a mixture of both so they see your merit uh, essays as well and your financial uh, aid uh, form as well so uh, if you talk about those universities they you will be evaluated on both of them so yeah Uh, thank you, Samit. Uh, Shivansh is asking. Uh, I don't have great scores in ninth standard. Could it be a problem for me? So I, I personally think your grades matter. But uh, let's say if you have a sixty percent in ninth, and then you get a ninety percent in tenth, then you get a ninety percent in eleventh, and ninety percent in twelfth, then it should not matter because it's a rising graph, right? But but don't be all over the place. Don't have a, have grades like sixty in ninth, ninety in tenth, fifty in eleventh, and then you know. Uh, again, eighty-five and twelve, because because then the universities won't be able to place you in a certain bracket. Moreover, if you get fairly good grades in tenth, eleventh, and twelfth, then you can simply justify that. Well, in, during my ninth standard, uh, you know, I was medically uh, like I had some problems, or uh, you know, I could not do well. So it can be justified. But if you have grades all over the place, it'll be very difficult for you to justify. Uh, next, we have a question from uh, Richard. Is it's Is it important to take AP exams in order to get financial aid? Uh, I don't know. Would you want to take that? Uh, I think it is important to take AP exams to get accepted, and then you get financial aid. So, um, but uh, again, if you don't have access to AP exams or they are too costly for you, there's no need in the world to take them. But if you can, you know, um, afford and you can essentially have the time to prepare for them, definitely take two or three. Uh, After your tenth grade. Uh, thank you, Arunak. I hope that answers your question, Richa. Uh, Tamanna is asking. So, if you're applying for biological sciences program and you've uh, got above ninety in all four years in school in biology, would it matter if you have comparatively low grades in few subjects in one or two uh, in your four years? I think as Samit mentioned before, uh, they look at your aggregates. And uh, you know, as as long as you can uh, like the overall average of the grades that you have gotten, and as long as you can justify as to why uh, you got low scores in other uh, subjects, I think uh, you should be good to go. So Shreesh is asking, uh, what is a good academic profile? Uh, what are good scores for IVs? Uh, Samarit, who do you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, this relates to someone who asked about his ninth grade. Uh, I used to play a lot of tennis in ninth grade. I was out for tournaments. I never really used to appear for classes and stuff. So I got like a very low score in ninth grade. But uh, then I got in my mind like, okay, I uh, need to study something. So in tenth, I, I, I think I got a ninety six. Eleventh was ninety eight. Twelfth was ninety seven. So, uh, but I would say anything above ninety three, uh, in CBSC. I'm I'm talking about uh specific boards. CBSC. Uh, most of the students are in CBSC. Uh, not a lot of people are from state boards, so I would say CBSC is uh, the top contender. Uh, CBSC is above ninety three for tenth and twelfth. I know eleventh takes a dip in most of the cases. Uh, so eighty five above in eleventh and uh, ninth really doesn't matter. Ninth is a really low class, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you talk about SAT scores. Uh, You can get anything between fourteen fifty to fifty to sixteen hundred. Uh, that's that I would consider a good score. But specifically, if you're talking about IVs and you're talking about international students, fifteen hundred plus, fifteen twenty plus is a is a sufficient score. It's a safe score to go for. No, thank you so much. Uh, I don't know. Uh, next question. I think we'll be able to answer. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, how many AP exams did you both take? So how many uh, I took, take? yeah, I took two. Uh, which I don't know if it was a good decision because you know that was the first year they switched to the online MCQ format. Uh, but I did end up getting a four and a five in AP Bio and Psych, so I ended up submitting those two. 
Right, and, and I think uh, Samarth is gone for a bit. Uh, so we'll get so back I, to those. I'm just oh. finding a thousand points. Okay. I, I I didn't took any APs. So, uh, but a lot of people when I was applying to Penn, they tried to scare me that you have not given any AP, you won't get in, and all that. So don't go upon those roads. I didn't take any of the APs, and still got in. So yeah. Um, and essentially, uh, the key takeaway is basically have a holistic application and don't be afraid to apply. After all, if you don't apply, you won't know, right? So, so often, like I've been discouraged by my counselors that okay, uh, don't apply to this IV, don't apply to that school. Well, it's your application. Apply to all twenty schools. That's the first uh, suggestion. Second, apply to at least two to three IVs that you really, really want to go to. Okay, you you never know uh, which. Like you, you might be surprised. Right. Uh, also, Dhruv, uh, I think APs are very important because they also give you college credits. So, in, in case you're looking to uh, graduate early or you're looking to, you know, spend less, so that's also you can. Uh, that's also one way you can save on money. You can give uh, like four or five APs, earn those college credits, and not, uh, you know, take those classes once you're in college. Moreover, you can do some summer sessions and graduate in two to three years rather than spending, you know, like uh, that amount in or, a four-year uh, education. Uh, Shivansh is asking, would it be considered too late if I apply to any of the universities now? I think it's never late, but uh, given uh, the deadlines, if the deadlines are still open, uh, and if 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 you have uh, a, you know a res resume made and if you have other things uh, made, I think you should apply and, and take your chances this year as well. Otherwise, uh, you can always take a gap and uh, uh, apply for the for next year. Uh, I, I would highly recommend Shivansh that you get in touch with uh, the the Unilai advisor. You can simply go to the website and uh, call the toll-free number. Uh, Punag is asking, my marks dipped in class 10th. I got 92%, but I uh, was very, like, I had very good scores in 9th and 11th and 12th. Would it affect my application seeing the dip in my 10th marks? I think 92 is not a dip, honestly. Uh, as both Samit and Arena mentioned that uh, Anything above a 90 or a 93, you know, it's, it's considered A. So if you have above, like, if you have more than 92 marks in your 9th, 11th, and 12th, I don't think uh, uh, there's any problem. You're good to go. Uh, so, so that'll be the end of questions uh, for now. Uh, Samarth, uh, has COVID-19 imp impacted your scholarship in any way? Like, has Penn given you any restrictions or, like, like uh, or any other clauses? Uh... No, I don't think so. I think COVID-19 uh, really made it uh, simple uh, for me to, you know, explore more colleges because a lot of colleges are having virtual fairs. Otherwise, in the case, it's all in person. People, you know, they do campus tours. Uh, most of my friends in America who got into Penn, they have, you know, done campus tours. Uh, they have sat in physical classes and lectures, which are for guests. Uh, uh, I would say COVID-19, although my health was affected by COVID-19, I would say my, it, it really helped me in my admission process because I think a lot of things have went online and as the things shift online, it becomes uh, really accessible for international students, specifically for kids from India to, you know, apply to these universities. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I think some universities cut down on their costs because of COVID-19, so they might have not given as much scholarship as they give in any uh, in any other year, but I think all of these high endowment universities, Penn, Yale, or Harvard, I don't think so. Uh, COVID nineteen really affected their scholarship rates. Uh, how about you, uh, Arun? Yeah, I agree. I don't think it reduced anything, and they even offered like safety funds for people impacted by COVID-19. I think one thing that it definitely impacts is, you know, traveling to the university and then going home for the breaks. So that is something that got a little complicated, uh, also getting a visa, but otherwise, acceptance-wise, scholarship-wise, I don't think it affected. Uh, I, I would disagree with uh, both Samant and Arunay because uh, I'm at a state university, so University of California, Davis. So all state universities, I mean, even if it's like a, a state and private university, like in case of uh, Davis, uh, they were very restrictive with giving scholarships to international students. And I hardly think any Indian has gotten more than a 20% scholarship from Davis uh, this year. So uh, if, if uh, like, you're really looking at your finances, I think I would, disc I would 
ask you to apply to state universities, but then refrain from having too many state universities uh, in your application or like uh, in your college list for the coming year uh, because of the pandemic. Because because I believe that the local state governments would want to fund their own kids rather than funding students from abroad uh, uh, during this pandemic. Uh, so th this is the end of our panel. And before we leave, uh, I'd like you all to please share a, a unique experience uh, that you've had in your university so far. And uh, I think I, I can start. So uh, I'm in my senior year and till date, I had no idea there was something called freshman initiation. So Davis is a bike city and uh, there is a, a place called Silo where we all go for lunch. There are like 10 food trucks and there is a roundabout, which is uh, in like a unprotected, unmanned roundabout. So imagine 30 to 40,000 bikes going in that roundabout and going in different directions. You know, so like, like uh, one's going clockwise, like everyone's going clockwise. And then one is taking the right, someone is take, going straight, someone is taking a left. And it's quite fun to watch freshmen crash into each other. So, so this is the first time I did it. I, during the first day of school, uh, this was in January because we were remote before that. I went, I was quietly eating my food and watching freshmen crash into each other. Trust me, it's fun. I, I know it's quite painful, but it was fun to watch. Uh, uh, I don't know, Samut. Uh, for me, it was not that you know, adventurous, but um, I joined the undergraduate consulting group here and they had a really good retreat where we drove out to like one hour, one hour away from Yale uh, to this lake resort. And there was a lake, we went fishing and rowing. It was a lot of fun spending a day there. Right, thank you, uh, Samit. Well, I'm someone who quite uh, likes adventures a lot. So since I came to Penn, I went on mountain biking. I've gone on rock climbing. I've gone to multiple uh, these adventures. I, I think we have a really good uh, three to four floor gym, which has a big wall. So I do climbing there. But the most interesting part for me was rushing, uh, which I told about Greek life. Uh, when I came to Penn uh, from India, I was like, okay, I'm someone who is very academically focused. I won't join any frat or anything like that. But now I think the Greek culture has sort of, uh, you know, took me into the roles and I feel it's, it's really nice to rush because they take you to different fraternity, they take you to different events, they take you to, you meet new people, it's a really good uh, experience and uh, uh, once you do a lot of hard work on those big days and you study a lot, you deserve a break on Saturdays and Sundays. So yeah, uh, Greek life, partying and uh, going for these rush events were, were a bit unique experience. And, uh, thank you, Samit. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. I, I would highly recommend uh, going to the Inralize website and uh, looking, you know, just browsing through because a lot of things that we discussed uh, like today with you, you guys is all available on the website. It's basically like, like a one-stop solution rather than browsing on Google, going to 50 different websites, uh, you know, uh, looking at different, like looking at contrasting answers, just go to this one-stop platform where you can get everything and anything. Uh, thank you so much.